quick set of rules. The way this is going to work is the team is going to get 20 minutes to speak, and after which we're going to take five minutes of questions. First questions are going to come from the judges, and if we have a little bit more time, we will take questions from the audience, and then we'll have another five minutes to switch between teams. So first up, we have NTHU Formosa. Take it away. We are MTHU Formosa from Taiwan. This year, we are very excited to present our project, BioWatcher. It is a brand new system for smartwatch to watch your health. And let's talk about smartwatch first. Nowadays, more and more people wear a smartwatch. The global market of smartwatch is reaching 35 billion US dollars soon. Why is smartwatch so popular? because it is a portable personal devices which non-invasive and real-time monitor our health condition from wrist blood vessel. However, the current devices can only track the limited conditions such as heart rate, step taken, and calories burned, which makes smartwatch not so useful. Actually, in bloodstream, there are many circulating molecules serve as biomarkers representing our physiological and pathological conditions. For example, high level of AFP, TAG72, and VSIG4 indicates liver cancer, colon cancer, <coughs> liver inflammation, respectively. Although these biomarkers can tell us so many information, smartwatch can read it. And one of the most common way to check out these biomarkers is blood test but no one likes blood test. Although it can collect most of the biomarkers, the invasive process of serine injection is painful, and it only reports your health condition at the time point you receive blood test. These drawbacks may discourage people to take blood tests frequently. And indeed, according to our World Well Survey, almost half of participants never took blood tests in three to five years. As you know, many diseases could progress to incurable level within three years. And such low level, low frequency of blood tests cannot prevent it efficiently. And to overcome this global issue, we would like to build up a new approach. BioWatcher! It, we aim to build up a programmable system for comprehensively recognizing various biomarkers and also offer non-invasive and real-time tracking. To achieve this, we, aim to, uh, we would like to uh, engineer blood cells and endow them with capability of recognizing biomarkers and then autonomously trigger output signal for diagnosis by smartwatch. And that zoom into the detail of our engineered blood cells. On their surface, to recognize different circulating biomarkers, which mainly exist at extracellular space, we use one uh, we use one special form of antibody, the nanobody, in our system. Nanobody is derived from the variable region of chemo antibody, owing to its unique features such as small size, good solubility, affinity, and specificity is with its antigen. Our, our system, uh, by, swap, by swapping the nanobodies in our engineered blood cell, our system is programmable for comprehensively recognizing various bio biomarkers. Here, for example, some of them is N5, T42, NB991 nanobody can specifically bind to those biomarkers in our bloodstream. So, our first question is how to trigger our biological system by the antigen binding on the cell surface. <coughs> Previous several studies split the nanobody into an N-terminal fragment and C-terminal fragments and found that the antigen binding will trigger the thermalization of them. So, based on this, we also split our nanobody into an N-terminal fragments and C-terminal fragments, but also we check them with different transmembrane proteins. Theoretically, antigen binding will trigger the demonization of these two split nanobodies. 
and the dimerization can be further to utilize to induce downstream signaling. So to prove our concept, here we choose one well-studied well nanobody, a GBP, and antigen GFP, representing biomarkers in our system. First, we would like to know whether the antigen, uh, whether the GFP binding will trigger our split GFP fragments stimulation. We obtain the GFP 3D structure and the membrane-bound GFP N and membrane-bound GFP C and put these three molecules in the same system and use molecular dynamic and analysis to simulate their interaction. As you can see, GLP serves a good scaffold to bind to both <coughs> membrane bounding GPN and GPC fragments. So with this with our simulation results, it highly supports that a GFP binding can trigger the thermalization of our split GPP, GPP fragments. Our sex our second question is, how we utilize the thermalization to induce downstream signaling? So here, we take split TEV of molecular scissors at the intracellular, at the intracellular site of transmembrane proteins. And when the dimerization happens, it will, we will make the split TEV, split TEV get closer and give back the enzyme activity to cut off the adjacent cutting site, the TCS. This cleavage will release a transcription factor to induce downstream signal. This is our design of sensing module. So to test whether our system really works, we use and cherry a red fluorescent protein in our experiment. So based on our design, again, the binding of GFP will release TTA, the transcription factor. TTA then will be translocated into the nucleus, bind to TRE3 trip promoter, and induce the and cherry expression. So to do this, first, we express and purify uh, GFP from E. coli system. They are very beautiful. And then we incubated our backwater cells with <coughs> these GFP. This is the 3D image of the biowater cell, and the green spots are GFP. As you can see, any cherry signal is induced in the biowater cells when the cell is bounded by GFP. Now let's look at it after a lower magnification. So the cells that are not bounded by GFP, they are not giving m signal, of course. But look at the cells that are bounded by GFP. More than 94% of them is expressing m signal. So this result tells us, <coughs> confirm, that our design actually works, and that our design, uh, that our biowater cell can sense the GFP binding and process to the m expression. Now we're very curious about the sensitivity of our biowater system. So we incubated the biowater cells <coughs> with different concentration of GFP, ranging from 0 to 100 nanogram per milliliter. Now you can see the increase of GFP binding to the biowater cells when the cells are incubated with more dose of GFP and the increase in the population of m positive cells can also be observed when the backwater cells are incubated and uh, when the GFP binding increase. And we quantify this data. As low as 10 nanogram per milliliter of GFP can induce significant increase in the population of m positive cells. And the plateau level is reached at 75 nanogram per milliliter. So the result tells us that our biowater system is highly sensible and reliable to de detect GFP between 10 to 75 nanograms per milliliter, and that this system can be induced, can be triggered in a dose-dependent manner. Now next, we really want to know how much time our biowater system, uh, our biowater system need to take to process from the input, the binding of GFP, to the output, the m expression. So we incubated the biowater cells with the same amount of GFP for different incubation time. Now four hours of incubation time is enough for the GFP to bind to the biowater cell. However, it takes a bit longer for 
the backwater cell to process from input to output. And as you can see in the quantification data, at six hours of incubation time, you can see in a significant increase in the entry positive cells. So this result tells us that our biowatcher system can take as fast as six hours to process from the input to the output. So at this point, this quick responding system can offer a real-time tracking for <coughs> biomarkers or soluble ligands at six hour uh, temporal resolution. And comparing to blood tests, this is pretty fast. Now, we would like to move our BioWatcher system a step forward to make it available for a non-invasive diagnosis. And the fluorescence we use in the experiment here is not as good because it needs external light source to stimulate the light emission. So we changed the fluorescence into bioluminescence. And bioluminescence is light we obtain from chemical reaction. The enzyme luciferase, it catalyzes the substrate luciferase and uh, results in the bioluminescence production. And owing to its low background, it has been widely used in non-invasive imaging. But conventionally, it is necessary to invasively inject external substrates into the system for bioluminescence production. To avoid the invasive procedure, we choose an autonomous bacterial lux system, uh, which the uh, which use LUX A and B as enzyme of the spritz and use LUX CTE and FRP to convert endogenous metabolites in mammalian cells into the substrates that are needed for bioluminescence production. So in our design, the expression of LUX CTE and FRP is continuously driven by CMB promoter. So our bioluminescence cell keeps generating substrates. And the expression of LUX A and B is regulated by TRE3G promoter, which will only be activated when TTA binds to it. So theoretically, the binding of GFP will release the TTA, activate the TRE3G promoter, induce the expression of LUX A and B, and result in the bioluminescence production. And this is the experimental result we get using IVIS spectrum imaging system. Now, when, although when the GFP is absent, we can, uh, the, our biowatcher cell exhibits some background signal showing a blue and green color here. But when GFP is present, you can see significant uh, the, uh, the uh, bioluminescence the biowatcher cell produced can be significantly uh, distinguishable from the background signal. And we have to emphasize that in this experiment, we didn't add any external substrate to get the bioluminescence signal. Our biowatcher cell autonomously uh, produce bioluminescence signal when they sense GFP binding. So, Let's summarize the features of our biowatcher system. First, as using nanobodies as our sensing module, biowatcher is highly programmable, which can comprehensively detect different kinds of biomarkers. Second, as our data show, biowatcher is a quick responding system, which can offer real-time tracking with six hours temporal resolution. And third, with the autonomous lug system, biowatcher is available for non-invasive diagnosis. These features offer many new applications, so let's go back to the smartwatch. By putting a sensitive camera on the back of the smartwatch, we can non-invasively and real-time track the level of biomarkers in our body. And we also designed a user-friendly app to extend this application. This is the first page of our app. We can detect the level of biomarkers whenever we want, so let's click the measure button and see what will happen. The smartwatch will start to measure the bioluminescence and tells you the level of biomarkers in your body. Once the level is too high, according to the database, 
It will pop up the description about what the result means and even give you clinical suggestion. Beside manual measurement, the smartwatch can be set up to detect the biomarkers over the time and will only notice you when the level of biomarkers is too high. In this case, the smartwatch just tells you you had high risk of liver cancer and it will try its best to force you to go to the hospital. <laughs> and we also have GPS functions to guide you to the nearest hospital and make an appointment online. Beside personal health monitor, we also want to collect the data and upload for public health analysis. Combining the BioWatcher system and the SmartWatch app, we anticipate this will revolutionize the current way of diagnosis in the future. The BioWatcher cell sounds awesome, but we have to apply it to our human bodies. So how can we do? So far, we only did the in vitro experiments to prove our concepts. However, we provide two strategies for FDA approved and we want to use. So the first one is minimal invasive and the other one is non-invasive procedure. For the first one, more and more CAR T therapy have, have been to target to the cancer cells for human bodies. They engineer the immune cells and inject it back to bodies. So based on the mature skills and technology, we would like to introduce our biowatches component to mesenchymal stem cells and inject it back to our circulation system. And the other one, non-invasive procedure, is about uh, gene delivery by adeno-associated virus. And it will in introduce our bio introduce AAV and carry our biowatches component <coughs> by intranasal delivery. And using blood cell specific promoters, our signal can be expressed in blood cells. So these two strategies can use to apply our biowatches component to human bodies. And we also have biosafety design. Since we attempt to use this system in human body, it is very crucial that this aspect is considered. So we, in case our system goes wrong in the human body, we, um, we here have a approach to erase all these biowatcher systems from the user's system. So in our design, we will conjugate from a kind of protein to the split sensing module and also manipulate the cell apoptosis using auxin-regulated promoter. So based on auxin-based grown system, once we introduce auxin into the user's system, the split sensing module will be soon degraded. <coughs> and within a few hours, the biowatcher cell will experience cell death to complete the whole erasing process. So beside the biowatcher, our system is not just for diagnosis. As we mentioned before, there are over 2,000 kinds of nanobodies has been established for binding to different molecules. And these numbers are still quickly growing. By changing the nanobodies, we can detect, for example, heavy metal ions, toxins, or cancer cells. We can also easily trigger the gene expression such as reporter genes, therapeutic genes, or genes that can kill cancer. With the unlimited combination of the input and output, the biggest limitation is probably your imagination. At the end of our talk, we want to thank our sponsors. Without your support, we couldn't finish our project and share it with you. Thank you for listening. Thank you guys, nice talk. Questions from the judges? So you showed um, in your initial experiments that you saw a six hour um, delay in the fluorescence um, assays that you did and then you mentioned that in order to use this conceivably in a human, you would have to use bioluminescence instead of fluorescence. Did you do um, similar um, time tests for that, those experiments as well to see how long the bioluminescence takes to develop, especially since you're using a two part system? Um, well. In our experiment, uh, mostly they are done by, done by the fluorescence because of limited time. 
Um, but in our in vitro experiment using bioluminescence, uh, the incubation time is about a day. Uh, so after a day of incubation, we can get the bioluminescence signal using the IBIS uh, imaging system. Uh, and we get, uh, but if uh, for uh, to use it in the human system, then we need more research. Um, on the same line, I had a question about the stability of your um, uh, your luminous the protein that being bioluminescent. How long? What's the serum persistence of the protein uh, like? And how long do you think it will stay in the blood for you to be able to measure it? Like, does it get degraded in the blood? Is that Um, it's about 12 to 24 hours for the balances to degrade in the system. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I like uh, the project design very much. It looks promising. However, um, when you started your presentation, you said, well, the bio workshop is not an invasive method, so people don't need to have uh, this uh, matter. Um, Thing, <laughs> yeah. these injections, but now you are designing something that will end up in kind of gene therapy or uh, AAV doses um, uh, to get inhaled. That worries me a bit more. Did you have a, a look in how public thinks about this difference? Oh, well, uh, the invasive here, we mainly pointed to the, uh, well, the like injection this kind of invasive <coughs> and of course uh, introducing the uh, modified cell into the um, human body is another kind of invasiveness, yes. And how do you think uh, people will uh, react on that? Well, well I, we think that this issue is uh, very alike to how people are afraid of or even against uh, GMO food. So in this case, we probably need more um, public education to them, like, well, make them understand that there's many advantages in the using this kind of technology in advanced science. Thank you. Hey guys, great presentation. I really liked it. Uh, I have a quick question and a follow-up question. Quick question is specifically, what cell type were you trying to? target here in terms of engineering. And what cell type did you use in like your in vitro studies? Uh, we use Hectomine 3T in our in vitro study. And for actually executing this, what cell type were you looking at? Uh, we're looking at mesenchymal stem cell because it's hemopoietic cells and it uh, suppresses the immunal response uh, during, the trans uh, during and after the transplantation. And the culture procedure are, has been well established also. So these are the reasons that we're looking at mesenchymal stem cells. That directly leads into my next question, which is, do you have a feeling for <clears throat> how the expression of your total package would affect immune response within those cells? Well, for that, we think we need a further experiment to know, but, um, yeah. <laughs> sure. Any other questions? Yeah, maybe just one uh, technical question, maybe. Uh, you showed that your detection limit of the GFP was about 10 to 70 nanogram. Um, how about the concentrations in blood of these significant biomarkers? Are they in the range of the nanograms? Okay, very nice question. So, um, first of all, the detecting range for the uh, for the biomarkers will change uh, because of the uh, nanobody and the, the the affinity of nanobody to the ligand. This is the first point. And the second <coughs> is that since there's many kinds of nanobody and their normal level in human circulation. Uh, mesh system actually uh, are there are various uh, range of them. So um, like uh, AFP, the normal range is 10 to 500. 
but like um, CA125 or CA199, the normal range is below 37 or 39. So depending on which kind of biomarker we want to detect, uh, we need, uh, the range will be different. Okay, so um, we are unfortunately out of time, so thank you very much for your presentation.